Let me start, Thea. People have been um, coming in with questions for you. Dragon's Den, I hear you're making a return, is that right? Well, technically, you're right. Um, I've just... We just, like technicalities. Uh, yes, you like you do a lot of technical here at GB News. Yeah. So I've just done two episodes, last two episodes that mm -hmm. have been broadcast, and I've got one more episode next week. So I stood in for Peter Jones uh, for the last series right. when uh, he was isolating because he went somewhere he shouldn't do. So he had to take a couple of weeks off. So they gave me a call. And the uh, same thing happened in the previous series when um, Tuka was taken poorly. Right. So um, I'm, I'm like um, the Bobby Ewing at the shower. I seem to be going back. So, uh, so I've had, had great fun doing it. Great fun catching up with Deborah That's and the rest brilliant. of the team. So that was good fun. So when will viewers be able to see you? Well, the last two weeks they've been watching me. Oh, they've been watching? Oh, yeah. God. So, spot, you missed me the, again. Yeah, spot the um, so, non-avid Dragon's Den <laughs> watch there. What can I say? So, but don't worry, I'm on next week as well. Oh, right. Oh, well, there you go. That's what I meant, when can they see you? So if you've missed him like what I've missed him, next week it will be watching. I'll be tuning in. I'll be glued. Um, let me talk to you, Thea, about the whole COVID and the impact, because obviously you're a very successful businessman, you've got a lot of retail stuff going on. What impact has COVID had on you and your businesses? Oh, wow. I mean, that's a six million dollar question. It's been devastating for everybody in shopkeeping world, that retail, because obviously on that fateful day, late March, when we had to shut our shops, send our staff home, um, and all camp back home on, on using uh, our, our laptops to communicate, with all our income went, our expenses were still mounting up. Obviously, the Chancellor stepped in with some help, which was really greatly appreciated at the time. Um, and then we had to find different ways of trading. And when you've got 300 stores and you're mainly a, a physical retail on the high street, although we've got websites, our focus has always been on physical retail. Mm. So, you know, our, our, our colleagues were absolutely brilliant. So everybody adapted. Um, we started contacting suppliers, seeing who had stock, everything else, trying to get pull stock out of the stores, to get back to our warehouse and try and meet our customers' demands online, which we did very successfully. Um, and, it, and it kept us alive, as, as, along with the, the, um, the business rates uh, holiday, which is superb, uh, and the, the furlough scheme. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about the government support packages. Do you think that that's been enough? Has it been enough for you and your business? Have you needed anything else? Has it kept you going? Wow, well, I mean, listen, what's enough? I mean, when you're decimated, as people have been, and businesses have been, especially the self-employed, um, that found it even harder to uh, access help. Uh, it's been very difficult. But, you know, there's only so much people can do. I mean, initially, uh, the Chancellor, uh, I mean, he just got his blunderbuss out, stuffed it with £50 notes at the end and just fired it at the economy. Yeah. And everybody had to grab some of it to try and keep alive. We didn't know how long it was going to last for, what the effect was going to be, were we all going to die, were we all going to be in hospital. I mean, it's quite frightening watching those pictures coming back from Italy where the hospitals and, and the health service was overloaded. People were on trolleys in the hospitals, in the corridors, outside, in ambulances. I mean, it was quite frightening. It was, and I remember not, it well. You know, and then there was, there was the, the personal... Uh, dynamics where people were starting to lose their loved ones and their loved ones were being ill going to hospital. So it was really, really a difficult time. So um, the, 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 the furlough scheme was, was really good because it meant that we could retain our colleagues uh, and without it, we wouldn't have business today. Yeah. And also the, 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 the business rates, the suspension of the business rates, now, that shouldn't even exist anymore. It's an archaic tax. Yeah. It's, it, it's a ridiculous tax. Nobody can justify it. And it should, you know, it was from the 1500s. How can we have a tax that was in the 1500s relating to today's world? Well, it puts you at a disadvantage to pure online retail. Well, the ye old internet didn't exist in the 1500s, did it? No. Uh, well, no. You don't, don't remember it? I was just about to say, I was just about to make a hilarious quip about not being that old, but I thought, no, I won't, I won't do that. <laughs> but no, so, but you've then had to almost pivot. So, yes, you will have had some online services, but you, you mentioned yourself almost pure retail, high street. Yeah. You've had to switch and pivot through the COVID times. Are you going to stick with more online stuff or are you looking forward to getting straight back into the high street as you once were, gusto into the high street? What do you think for your business and also the, the high street more generally? What's the high street going to look like once we do, I don't, dare I say, get back to normal? Well, what is the new normal? Mm. And the new normal, believe you me, is exactly what it says, new normal. 
It's not the old normal. And we'd already invested a lot of time and money onto our online platform. So we were able to really uh, leverage that during uh, lockdown, which was really helpful. Um, the stores have opened again, even though footfall is still 20 to 25% down. And for a business like Ryman that's in stationery and really made most of its money, if not all its money, in the city of London and in metropolitan areas where there's offices, well, those areas are decim have been decimated. Mm. They're like ghost towns. Yeah. So you have stores that were making a, a, a great contribution back to uh, head office costs that are now making deficit contribution. So what would happen to those stores then? Would, would a business like yours keep those stores open so that once we're, we're bustling because of all the free fall, that the free fall's gone, what would a business like yours look to do? So you've got these stores that were once probably crowners yeah. In your, in your Those are jewels in the crown, absolute yeah. jewels in the crown. Now, what, there's very simple, Michelle. Um, we've been negotiating with landlords to reduce rents, which and, and most landlords have been really, really good. Obviously, there's some numpties. We won't talk about them. Um, but most have been really, really good. But you can't negotiate business rates. If business rates comes back, those shops are toast because we just will not be able... At the moment, there's nobody in those areas. So we, ref we would be forced to close those down if people don't go back to work and if people don't go back to their offices. And maybe, you know, that, that's the things that, are, for us, that's the things that keeps us awake at night. You know, the fact that, you know, if people don't go back to the offices, to the, to the cities, the main cities, then we've got a problem. Yeah, see, that was one of my questions, actually. You preempted it in terms of what keeps you awake at night. So you're... Oh, I'm reading your script, aren't I? I know, I was going to say. Oh. Re... Can you see it somewhere? <laughs> I need to hide my questions, but I will come back to that in a different context. But um, how much of your workforce is now still on furlough versus back at work? No, we've, everybody is now back at work. There might be a handful of people because of medical reasons yeah. that can't go back to work at the moment or who have been poorly with COVID. But otherwise, um, everybody's back at work. And was there a reluctance for people to get off furlough and go back to work? Because there's a lot of criticism towards workers at the moment saying they don't want to get off furlough. Did you experience well, that? Yeah. Um, well, I can uh, I can safely say the, the Ryman teams, Robert Dyes, Ambu Avenue, were driving me nuts, saying, we hope the shop's are going to open. We hope the shop's are going to open. As soon as the shop's open, everybody was back. I mean, people got fed up. They wanted to get back to doing what they are passionate about and what they really enjoy. And... Um, one of the things that we've been looking at over the last couple of days is about mandatory vaccines. So we've been talking about it making it mandatory potentially in care homes, NHS uh, workers. My concern, Theo, is when we start talking about making vaccines mandatory in those care settings, I was explaining this on my show yesterday, I think it's almost the thin end of the wedge because what happens is if you're going to start saying, right, care workers, you come in contact with um, vulnerable people, elderly, sick people, you've got to be mandate, you've got to be um, vaccine. Then where do you draw the line? Because then you've got suppliers coming in, you've got um, entertainers coming in. So you've got this whole third party supply chain. And I'm worried that if you start mandating vaccines over here, you will end up with a scenario where vaccines are just made mandatory. Michelle, Would are you, you... an anti-vaxxer? No, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Oh, right, okay. And I'll tell you what, I also am someone that really doesn't like that label that's become commonplace, that anti-vax label, because I have a lot of people, viewers, contacting me saying that they've had their jabs, they've had their inoculations, their babies have had their inoculations. I've had my two, so I'm saying we're safe. Yes, that's brilliant. But there are some people that haven't had... They've had all of their vaccines, but they haven't had this one, because when it comes to this one, they are anxious about it. Which because one? The COVID one. So they will say, well, you know, this one, it hasn't... You don't know what the long-term effects are, for example. Some people will say, well, I've had COVID and I've got the natural antibodies, so I don't need which, to inject which myself. Which we know disappear over a period of time. But what I'm saying less is... less effective. But what I'm saying is that that will be the pushback that people will say. So if you say, are you an anti-vaxxer, people will come back and say, it's unfair. And I actually agree it's unfair to label someone who's anxious about this particular vaccine, I don't think it's great well, I don't think you, can force any, you, should, you should force anybody to put into their body something they are not comfortable in doing, right? That's number one. But we need to be informed and people have got to take... When they make that decision, mm -hmm. and quite rightly they should be able to make that decision, that's so my you're view. against um, the mandatory pe pe people, people should be able to make... I'm, I'm finished. People should have the right to make the decision not to have a vaccine if they don't want it, and understand the consequences of 
having one or not having one. Yeah, but, I'm, I mean, but, I'm a... But there's a big, 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 big but. Doctors have to have various vaccines, whether they like it to work in the National Health Service. Yeah, we just had a doctor on and had right. this conversation. So, so, so the, fact, the fact is, if you are going to work with vulnerable people, you have a responsibility. So if you, uh, and that's where, that's where the argument lies, because as a vulnerable person, if it was you, your, 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 your parents, or myself, you know, I'd be worried if someone didn't have a vaccine and could possibly then, instead of helping me, damage me. Mm. So that's the difficulty you have. But you can't say to people, you have to have a vaccine. But if you're going to be mixing with vulnerable people, then sadly, that's a decision that, that I'm not sure you can leave. Um, let's talk corporation tax. We'll move oh, on. Oh, really? Yeah, we'll move on from vaccines because I know that this is such a topic that when, when we start getting into vaccines and mandatory, and I could sit and talk to you all day about it. And yeah. unfortunately for me, I don't have all day with you. Get off. Um, I know, I know. So, corp taxes talk about potentially raising corp tax to around 20, 25, sorry, 25%. Michelle, Michelle, I've what? never been, I'm looking forward to the day that we pay corporation tax again. After all the money we've lost, right? The only way you pay corporation I at, tax. I was looking at you then, thinking, "What do you mean? You yeah. should have been paying corp yeah. tax when you was making a profit." After all the money we've lost, yeah, you're meaning back. You what, if you're paying corporation tax, it means we're making profits again, which means we've recovered, which means our colleagues' jobs are safe again, our business is safe again, and I'll be ecstatic. But would you be ecstatic about it returning to a higher rate? Which is, I guess, my question. Well, what is a higher rate? Well, going up to say twenty-five percent. Oh come on! Well, you know. 25% isn't a high number, OK? We've it's all got responsibility. Yeah. It is, of course it's higher, but we've just had... Uh, spent 80 billion quid or something uh, with this COVID... Uh, rescue packages. Rescue packages, and with lots more to come. Uh, honestly, it, it, if, if you're... You're only paying corporation tax if you're making profits. If we're making profits again, then we have a responsibility to actually pay back in. It's so very simple. I don't know who... I've met anybody who would disagree with me. So, I'm happy to have that conversation. Let me ask you, um, I've got people messaging in. Um, so Catherine here, she's lost her job and she's asking you, Thea, I've lost my job, um, I need some advice. How, what advice can you give? Because at this moment in time, Thea, it's quite a competitive market for, for Labour, so lots of people are losing their jobs. Um, what advice would you give? Someone has been oh, made redundant. But do you know what, at the moment, Finding staff and colleagues to work with is actually a difficulty. There is a lot, although we're, we're seeing, we've seen redundancies and we've seen job losses, and we've seen as a furlough scheme will taper off in September, obviously we'll see even more. Yeah, I was just, just grabbed a cup of coffee before I came in, mm -hmm. and it was a Costa Coffee, lovely chap, and it was one minute past six o'clock, and I saw him locking up, but he kindly opened up and served me. Um, was that because I, it was you, or do you think he would have done that for anybody? It definitely would have done it for you. Would Defin he? Do you Defin think? Defin definitely oh, well, that. I'm going to test and, it. And I'm going to go to him, one minute past six tomorrow. I'm yeah, going to test go down there. Yeah, get Wigmore past. Street. Wigmore Street. I will. Costa Coffee, Wigmore Street. And I've got to tell you, so I said, well, how's business been? I said, thank you very much, obviously, I thanked him. And I said, how's, how's things been? It's been manic today, he said. It's been like Christmas. I said, well, I said but we're really short staff. Because lots of his colleagues went home during the pandemic or just beforehand and have not returned or haven't been able to return. Yeah, and I think that's one of the challenges. There are lots of people on Fairlow that have been almost artificially kept employed. And when you, the, the Fairlow, as you'll know, is going to taper imminently. And I worry what happens when, when Fairlow almost reaches its end. Well, it's already What's tapering. We're, as employers, we're, we're contributing more to people yeah. that we furlough. But September, it comes to an end. Uh, Nick Chancellor hasn't announced any extension of that. And again, we don't know what, where we're going to be in September. And I'm sure, if God forbid, that there'd be any more backtracking or any more lockdowns. But if there is uh, stress in the system again, I don't think you'll have an option but to extend it because we haven't spent all that money just to throw it away. 
mm. because of some, you know, a few, a few, a few billion. It's easy how we say it. A few billion pounds. Yeah, we do. We throw this money around, don't we? And um, by the way, um, Elizabeth Scott is just um, messaging just to say she loves you. That's <laughs> literally what she said. That's her. It's not a question. It's just a statement with an exclamation mark. She just wants to say she absolutely loves you. So that's. She's nice. a very sweetie. Thank you, Elizabeth. In, I love you too. Indeed. I want to ask you when it comes to staff, um, when it comes to training staff um, and all the new attitude shifts, etc. Do you do anything like unconscious bias training within your workforce? Unconscious bias training? Yes. Uh, uh, we live in a, a very fast changing world. Retail has been uh, for a, well, for, forever as far as I'm concerned, for all the years uh, I've been involved in retail, it's been a very inclusive, um, diverse uh, 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 staff uh, business where we really have embraced every part of the UK economy and culture. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's very important that all our colleagues understand how the world is changing. The biggest, the biggest issue I have with, with, I think I know what you're getting to with this, is that we, we do need to stop beating ourselves up sometimes and trying to judge yesterday's actions by today's standards. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work. You know, you can't. There's lots of things went on when I was a kid. I won't tell you what I thought my name was when I was about seven or eight years old growing up in Manchester. Mm. You, know, uh, you know, but there wasn't malice. There was just ignorance. There's a lot of ignorance existed. And I can't call my parents, and my mother, she passed away sadly, but uh, God rest her soul. I'm not going to call her ignorant. But we weren't educated the way we're educated now, and the understandings that we have now, and, and, which is great. And it, it, it definitely is a case that we should make sure people understand the sensitivities of other people's, but, in, but take it in, in the round, in reality, not overdo it, but at the same time, understand that we have to be inclusive, we have to be diverse, we are a diverse country. So in a similar theme to this then, uh, you used to own a football club, chairman of a football club yourself. I was, uh, Millwall, Millwall, Mighty Lions. Indeed. Um, taking of the knee, so Euros, you will see what's going on at yeah. Gareth Southgate's view. What's your view on that? Listen, um, I, I think kick it, I kick it out is... Uh, kick-out racism is still part of the football family. I'm not sure, but it was when I was uh, chairman. Don't forget, I've been gone like 15 years now, so a lot has but changed. But do you think England time. should be taking the knee before their match? Well, listen, it, 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 football is an answer. It's not a problem. People call uh, sometimes make fans to be a problem. They're not a problem. The more education we have in football, football just reflects our society. That fan base that that stands in the stands or sits in the stands is representative of our society. So you can't just say, oh, it's football fans. They are representative of our society. That's who we are. And it's a great opportunity to use football to educate. Football can be a solution. So you think they should be taking the knee or not? That, that's not what I said. So football can be a solution. The fact is, racism is, is a very, very serious and important subject mm. that we can't keep skipping round and putty-footing round. It's not acceptable, right? We've all been educated. We're living... I, 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 in 2021 and you know we should have whether it's the knee which the knee the only issue i've got with the knee it's come from america and it and it, it, it portrays lots of other things that don't relate to the yeah, united the whole kingdom BLM movement. and they don't relate to the united kingdom but i think it's great that professional football players should act like role models and show a, a clear stance that they're so anti-racism and that it's not acceptable, and it should be wiped out. Now, whether the knee, I don't think, is, is, is the one, but I think we should have our own. The professional football players and the, the, the PFA, the Premier League, the FA, the Football League need to get their act together, get together and put some serious money behind this, whether the players contribute as well and the FA contribute, the PFA contribute, put some serious money together so we can educate and make sure that this great game of ours does lots of other things other than just entertain.